Amen. Well, the singing sounds incredible. Amen. You know, it's already been such a great church service, and we haven't even gotten the word of God open. Amen. Well, we actually have, but it's time for the sermon. Let's turn our Bibles over to the book of Hezekiah. The book of Hezekiah. You guys there yet? Let me get an amen when you're there. Somebody said amen, but there is no book of Hezekiah in the Bible. You know, there's a lot of things that may sound like it's in the Bible. And yet when you start searching it for yourself, you get to see, huh, maybe that's not in there. We've seen a lot of things like only God can judge me. Guess what? That sounds good. It sounds like a scripture. No, no, no. That's just a song from Tupac. We've seen, listen to your heart as spiritual advice. Yeah, you start looking at the Bible and no, that's just a catchy song, but it's very dangerous. According to Jeremiah 17, that's the last thing we should do because it's deceitful above all things. One of the ones that I'm going to talk about today is, well, it doesn't really matter if you go to church. Or we've heard this one. It doesn't really matter where you go to church. You just got to find where it's most comfortable to you. Well, just like we found out Hezekiah is not in the Bible, <laughs> we're going to find out that that's not in the Bible either. In the title of this morning's lesson, The One True Church. The One True Church. And we're going to find out what that is this morning. Amen? Let's turn our Bibles to John 17. In John 17, before we start diving into the true church, and this morning, we're not going to hear a sermon about how Portland ICC is the one true church. What we're going to look at is look in the Bible and look at five different churches and learn what we need to imitate so we can strive to be the one true church. Amen? Amen. John 17, and before we go look at the churches, we must look at Jesus and his prayer for the churches before the even church started in verse 20. This is his last prayer before he goes on to the cross. And in verse 20, he says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me. That they may be one as we are one. I and them, you and me. So that they may be brought to complete unity. And then the world will know that you have sent me. And have loved them. Even as you have loved me. What was on the heart of Jesus? And you know when you're praying, that's when your heart gets exposed. That's why it's so bonding when we pray together, because we get to hear each other's hearts. For Jesus, what was, and if there is any prayer we should look at for a man, it's the last one. For Jesus, before he goes to get crucified, he's just praying, God, I'm not praying for these guys. Disciples are like, well, who are you praying for? I'm praying for them. I'm praying for those that will believe in the message. Jesus had a prayer that we could be unified, that the church could be unified, that disciples that follow him could be unified. Why? Because that's awesome? No. I mean, it is awesome. Amen. But he was saying, I pray that could get unified so the world can know that you have sent me. Now, we know Jesus is the Savior of the world. Amen? But no one else will know unless we build a church that's unified, unless our heart is to unify all disciples. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look, like I said, at five churches. And the first one is the Jerusalem church. The very first church. And we're going to look at five marks of the true church. And the first mark is the mark of the message. What message needs to be preached from the true church? In Acts chapter 2... Let me get an amen when you're there. Amen. Don't be just saying amen like we were earlier. Like Hezekiah, amen. Yeah. 
In Acts 2, verse 41, it says, Those who accepted the message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Acts 4, verse 4. Many who heard the message believed. And so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. And that's just the men. 5,000 men means about, with wives and kids, 10 to 15,000 in the Jerusalem church. In Acts chapter 5, verse 28, we get this said about persecutors. We give you strict orders to not teach in his name. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, and those days need to be these days, amen? amen. Verse 7. The word of God spread. And so the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and the large number of priests became obedient to the faith. What was so special about the Jerusalem church that's just a mark that it was God's church? It was the message. Over and over, we says the message spread. You see, when we plant churches or plant Bible talks, even a few minutes before I came up to preach, Paul Reddy comes up to me and he says, bro, I'm thinking it'd be awesome to have a mercy Bible talk. What's a mercy Bible talk? Well, we want to go and feed the poor, but in the meantime, we also want to do Bible studies with people. Because even in sending out mercy projects, the hope is that the message of God can spread. And it's always awesome to have those mercy projects because people are always blown away by the love, by the energy, and by the zeal of the disciples. Now, the first church service, they had 3,000 baptisms. What was the message? It was simple. Jesus died on the cross. And Jesus was resurrected. And now he commands all people everywhere to repent. I mean, don't you love it right there that it said Jerusalem was filled with the teachings of Jesus? I mean, I'm excited for the day when we have so many disciples in Portland where everybody just knows about the teachings of Jesus. They're just going, yep, I already been through all the Bible studies. You know, our brother Eric had an interview this past week with uh, Channel 6 News. Doesn't he look like someone that could work for Channel 6 News? He has the bow tie and everything. And yet, the woman says, you know, hey, you look very sharp. Where are you coming from? Eric said, well, I'm coming from church. <laughs> he went after church to the interview. She goes, well, what church do you go to? She goes, I go to the Portland International Christian Church. She goes, no way. I, I used to go to that church. You know when people tell you that and you're not really sure if that's true or not? Like, I, I know I went there last week. I probably would have seen you. But she goes, yeah, yeah, I was there when Ricky and Colleen were leading it. And so Eric has another face. He goes, man, maybe I'm here to interview you. Where have you been at? But just to see that the teachings of Jesus, and what is the teaching that was filled? Well, these guys, the persecutors were like, you just want to make us guilty of this man's blood. And no one likes to take ownership for their sins. And so instead of responding to the message like we need to respond, broken to the core and ready to change, what happened? They were like, run. And that's, that's the three ways that you respond to the teachings of Jesus. Either you're going to respond the way God wants us to, or you're going to run, or you're going to persecute. Those are the three ways. Either you're going to stay here, and in case you didn't know, this church is, is not built like most churches where it's based on the kids or, you know, like some people did in the past is follow their girlfriends to a church. Well, where do you want to go, honey? Well, wherever you want to go. Well, what religion are you? I'll just go to that religion. And sadly, instead of leading the way, you, what you see here is a church of people that have their Bibles open. Why do people have their Bibles open and notepads? Are they doing their homework while, while we're at church? I hope not, amen? I know it's midterms at PSU, but they're here opening up their Bibles because they say, hey, 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 Caesar's all right. But I'm not going to take his word for his word. Amen. I want to go in the scriptures. I want to hear God's message. 
And that's the only way you could respond to the message of Jesus if you're going after searching for the message of Jesus. You know, I appreciate the example of Nisha here because she was telling me, she goes, you know, I used to go to all these churches. I didn't really learn much and I wasn't growing until I met some disciples and they sat me down. And it was really cool the way she, Naomi put it. She said at her baptism, I'm excited to be partners against Satan together. Oh, man, that's a hard line right there. <laughs> We're partners against Satan. But then she, Nisha said something. She said, you know, I feel like I'm finally alive. I feel like even though I put my desires to death, that I don't even have a past anymore. I have a new family a new purpose, and a church with the message of God. Amen? I think, and I want to destroy this in your heart this morning, sincerity doesn't equal truth. We know that in Acts 2, the people were broken. But Peter said, you got to save yourself. In Acts 10, Cornelius was a man who was devout, sincere. Guess what? He even prayed, and God heard his prayers. But it said that he still needed to receive the gospel. And so God sent Peter to Cornelius to help him repent and get baptized. In Acts 16, we see Lydia, who was a worshiper of God. I mean, she was worshiping, going to church. But her heart still needed to be open to the gospel. In Acts 18, Apollos was fervently speaking about Jesus. I mean, this guy was a preacher. He was teaching about Jesus accurately. That means when people asked him about Jesus, he goes, I know who Jesus is. Until some disciples came into his life. And God is not going to be mocked. If you're really seeking God, even this morning, he's going to open your doors where he wants you to be opened. And I believe God has opened up our doors this morning to worship God together in a place where we're not going to take my words for it. We're going to open up the Bible and see how does someone become a follower of Jesus? What do we got to fill Portland with? The teachings of Jesus. Because even though some people will run from it, no, 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 I know what this guy's trying to do. This guy's trying to tell me that I've been living wrong because I've been in sin and I'm sleeping with my girlfriend and we're not together, but, but, but we're happily in love. No, no, no. If we lay out what the Bible says, then people will change. You know, I'm so excited to hear of even all the miracles that God has been doing around the world. Because when we plant a church, what are we planting? The teachings of Jesus. The hope of a new life. And just like Nisha said, man, I don't even feel like I have a past anymore. Because we are no longer going to be haunted by the regrets or the mistakes we made. But the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Acts chapter 11. The second church we're going to look at is the Antioch church. Why did the Antioch church get started? Well, you got to understand that the disciples in the first century were human beings just like us. So even though Jesus taught them over and over, hey guys, go to all nations. Go from Jerusalem to Judea. To the ends of the earth, what's the first thing they do? Stay in Jerusalem. They had 3,000 baptisms. I wouldn't want to leave a church that had 3,000 baptisms in one week. So they were fired up. They were going until seven years later, death started happening. And in Acts 8, Stephen died, the first martyr. And then they go, okay, guys, I think it's time we send a mission team. Why? Because people are dying here. <laughs> I think God wants us to, if we all die in Jerusalem, the message is not going to spread to all the world. Now, that gives me comfort to know we could continue to grow and God cares about progress. Amen? Amen. Individually and as a church. But in Acts 11, the Antioch church, we see the mark of discipling. The mark of a true church is discipling. In verse 19, it says, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch. I mean, they scattered once their brother Stephen died. Spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus, Cyrene, went to Antioch, and they began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus, and the Lord's hand was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. 
And when Barnabas arrived, he saw what the grace of God had done. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. A great number of people were brought to the Lord. And then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Wow. The Antioch church started baptizing Gentiles. Now remember Jesus over and over taught that the message is for everybody, the Jews and the Gentiles. They weren't teaching to the Gentiles until Antioch. And in Antioch, they started growing in their vision. And I think what we need to understand, disciples in Portland, you're being trained to go somewhere else. Disciples in Portland, you're being trained for the preparations that God has for you in the future. For them, Antioch was a beautiful place to be. Because they said, man, this is where we understand the messages for everyone. I know some of us this morning are thinking, no, 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 this isn't for me. Whoever invited me, I'm actually going to tell them to not invite me anymore because this is not for me. But you don't understand. The message is for everybody. And I'm here to tell you, someone invited you, not because it was in their nature. A lot of people are scared to invite other people to church. They invited you because they know it worked for them. And they responded to the message. And therefore, they know that anybody can change because anybody needs Jesus. Amen? Amen. This is what happened with Barnabas. Barnabas gets the news, the good news email. I don't know if it was an email back in these days, but he saw that the church in Antioch was growing. So he goes and checks it out. He goes, oh man, this is a lot of baptisms. This is a lot of people. And with a lot of people come a lot of problems. So he goes, we need to teach everybody here. He goes and grabs his brother Saul. And Barnabas was still leading the mission team because that's how you know in the Bible, they put things in order for very specific reasons. It says, Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas was leading. He goes, Saul, I need you to help me on out. For a whole year, they just stay teaching, teaching. And this is what we call discipling. Discipling is somebody in your life just trying to help you to be more like Jesus. And why are we persecuted? Because from the world's point of view, it looks like brainwashing. From a worldly point of view, it looks like they're trying to take control of you. No, no, no. That's the least of what we want to do. We want to help you be more like Jesus. And I appreciate the brothers that are in my life that help me be more like Jesus. But I got to ask you, do you have a teacher in your life right now? Discipling you. This isn't an option. Jesus says, baptize them and teach them to obey. We are all called to have a teacher in our lives. Now, how many of us remember our high school teachers or junior high teachers? Which ones do you remember the most? Do you remember the ones that were easiest on you? No. That didn't check your homework? That let you sleep in class? You don't remember them? Severine's like, yes, I do. Those, that's my favorite class. <laughs> I'm just kidding, sis. I had a teacher, Mr. McIntosh. I remember him. He was fierce. And for me, I was one of those kids that did fall asleep in class. But when I would fall asleep, he would grab a, a spray bottle and just spray me in front of the whole class. Even as I wake up, he's still spraying me. I'm like, dude, I'm up. One time he got so mad in class, he grabbed the marker. Just because we weren't really understanding this formula he was trying to teach us. He grabbed the marker and says, you guys are just not getting it. He throws the marker. Everyone stood up and said, all right, let's get this straight, guys. Come on. I mean... I go, Mr. McIntosh instilled in me the desire to study math. Before that class, I go, math is not for me. Anybody said that before? Yeah, math is just not for me. It's so easy to say that, but because you simply just don't like math. So it's easy to just say it wasn't for me. I, God did not give me the gift of numbers when I was born. And so therefore, I just cannot do math. And Mr. McIntosh instilled in me, actually, it's for everybody. And you guys are going to understand this. And ever since sophomore in high school, I said, I'm going to be a math teacher. I went to UCR. I said, I'm going to be a math major. And I studied math in college because simply I saw a formula. And I just remember Mr. McIntosh grabbing that mark. and said, Caesar, you can do it. <laughs> I just in my head, I, go, I know I can do it. And when I'm tempted to fall asleep, I still get some flashbacks of getting sprayed. 
Spiritually, it's the same thing. Somebody's going to get in your life and they might seem like a fierce person or they might seem like they don't love you. They might seem like they have anger management problems. They actually are indignant about sin. Being a disciple is not about making each other happy. Actually, in the word encouragement, what we see like encourage one another, we always think it's like make each other feel better. Buy each other some chocolates. That's the way we, when you think of encouraging someone, like get them. Keisha's like, give me some flowers. I need to be encouraged. Which, yes, that's a part of it. But the word encouragement in the Greek is to admonish one another. What is the most encouragement we get from one another? It's the fact that we got to go to the Bible and to you. And we say, where you fall short, that is your D time. And when you look at Jesus in yourself, tell me you don't have a lifetime of D times to go. Because we are sinners. And it's okay because we'll fall short. We will repent. And just like we got to raise up our kids in the Lord. And that's another thing. For a parent, our job is to be our, the best teachers for our kids. I know for us last week, uh, we just started showing Neo some television. Some persecution about that already. But one of the things we're showing him is VeggieTales. I didn't grow up on VeggieTales. So I saw my first episode last week. And it was so catchy. They throw one scripture in the whole thing. But it's these vegetables, and they were trying to teach people about the fact that you need to do your good works before God, not before men. And so they had a little city reunion, and they said, guys, we have a new building. And the most generous person is going to put their name on this building. And so the whole city starts singing a very catchy song, if you don't mind me singing it. I want my name with, I want the building with my name on it. Doo, 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 doo. I want the building with my name on it. And so all the vegetables start doing all these good deeds to show others. There's like the tomato with the ding, ding. I'm going to help this old lady. Ding, ding. And, 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 and then they show the scripture to him. They said, dude, Matthew 6 says, you shouldn't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Tomato's like, what's that got to do with me? You're dinging this thing, showing other people. And it just got me the vision that we so got to appreciate the fact that God has made us teachers of our kids. The question is, are you really teaching them? I so appreciate our teen workers like Aaron Valeria who teach our teens. But all of us here are spiritual kids that need the spiritual nutritions that need to grow up, and no one's going to remember your discipling unless it's going to be the ones that are straight from the scriptures. I know I've had conversations these last two weeks where I just had to apologize to some of the people I disciple and say, hey guys, I've not been as loving as I need to be, as direct as I need to be, and that is to my shame because I don't want people to leave with things that are in their heart without me being the God appointed person in someone's life to take care of it. What do we learn from the Antioch church? They had a teacher. They needed a discipler. And we as well, to be the true church, need discipling. Amen? Let's go to Acts 16. We're on to the third church, which is the Philippian church. Philippian church. Acts chapter 16. You guys still with me here? My wife asked me the other day, do you say, are you still with me here because you need encouragement or because you're stalling to look for the scripture? I said, it's both. <laughs> but in Acts 16, verse 22, says the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. That's not good. Paul's going to go plant a church in Philippi. What's the first thing that happens to him? Attacks says the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and to be beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they went and were thrown into prison. The jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up 
And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were baptized. That's incredible. What was the initial start to the church in Philippi? Attacks and persecutions. You see, everyone that wants to do the will of God will be persecuted. Anybody that stands up for the truth, that is what marks the true church. I'll never forget our brother Garrett Bradley, who was baptized in the IE region. He tells his dad, Dad, I'm going to the Portland International Christian Church. City of Angels, because this was in Los Angeles. Because I'm going to the International Christian Church. His dad says, what? You've been raised in my church? He was the deacon in the church. He goes, there's no way I'm going to let you just go. I'm going to do research on this church. Starts researching and sees all the junk online. That half-truths about, you know, these people will just love you because they want to see them as members in your church. And we call them half-truths because it's true, but it's also a lie. Do we love you? Yes. Do we want you to join our church? Yes. But... Do we love you because you want us to join our church? No. We love you because we want you to see the love of Jesus. And because we are filled with the love of Jesus, that's all we could do as disciples. Amen? His brother researches, his dad researches it and says, whoa, these guys are getting persecuted. I've always seen it in the Bible that the true church needs to be persecuted. He starts coming around. He studies the Bible, sees that even though he was religious in a church, matter of fact, he never repented of his sins. He never really became a disciple of Jesus, and therefore, he got baptized, and now is the main song leader there in the IE region. Amen? <laughs> Our sister Monique told us last week that the word despair, she learned this in class, means to suffer without meaning. You know, we only fall into a situation of despair when it has no meaning. For them, they were in prison, and some of us would be struggling at this point. Losing faith about the Philippi church. I mean, some of us would have been like, man, I think God's calling us to not go to Philippi. <laughs> I mean, it's tough. And we're in prison now. Dude, how are we going to evangelize Philippi if we're in prison? But they didn't get bitter, and they didn't get faithless. They said, Silas... Lead us into a song. But we don't have song books. It's okay, brother. I know you know a song by heart. I don't have my pitch pipe. They took it. It's okay, brother. We don't need to be on key. We just need to sing to the Lord with all of our hearts. They just start singing. And as they sing, the doors flow open. And then the jailer that was just flogging him says, what do I need to be saved? Now, he's not talking about spiritually saved because he doesn't care about how to get spiritually saved. He's talking about if these guys escape, what they would do to the Roman guards was torture them and kill them. So he sees the doors open. He goes, oh, man, I'm going to get tortured. Guys, what do I need to do to just not get killed by these Romans? He says, brother, and he takes this as an opportunity. Remember, we looked at make the most of every opportunity. These guys were like, I know what you need to do to be saved. You need to believe in Jesus. But yet they weren't saved until they went to their house. And it says they spoke the word of the Lord to them. And then they wash their wounds. And it says immediately. Why immediately after they wash their wounds? Because they saw they repented. Yeah. I think sometimes we're scared to show our repentance before man. Yet in Acts 20, it says, prove your repentance before man and before God. And we are to prove our repentance to each other. Because if it's not to each other, it's to ourselves. And when is the last time you judge yourself correctly? <laughs> we think everything either too highly or too low of ourselves. I mean, some of us look in the mirror and go, man, I'm so ugly and I'm so out of shape. And, oh, and that's how we live. And others look into the mirror. I'm not going to say any names, but they're like, man, I'm so good. <laughs> Hope I'm not giving anything away by doing this. I go, man, I'm so fresh. This outfit was a great outfit. I mean, I am so skillful at choosing my clothes. I told my wife, I go, babe, is this a nice shirt? She goes, yeah, that's awesome. I go, are you sure I didn't wear it last week, though? She goes, no, you didn't. On the way to church, I look at the picture of me last Sunday. It's the same shirt. So 
Sometimes your own judgment is wrong. Sometimes even your wife's judgment could be wrong. But you got to have a lot of people in your life that are judging you, that are going, hey, are you looking fresh? And I'm talking about spiritually, amen? The Philippian church marks persevering love. That's the mark of a true church. It's not that they say they love you. It's not that they love you. It's that they persevere in loving you. Because we know we're going to mess up with each other. But when I look at even the examples we see with Paul and Silas, they said, you know what? God has brought us here. We got to sing and really be content in every situation. What's amazing is a lot of us know the scripture, Philippians 4.13. Who could quote that for me? All things through Christ. That was written by Paul during his time of imprisonment in Philippi. We know that because in Philippians 4, he says, I am in chains here in Philippi. So in prison, Paul's going, I could do all things. I've learned to be content in all situations. I just got to ask you, are you content? And the word in the Greek means strong enough. He says, I'm just strong enough. Maybe I'm feeling weak. But man, I'm strong enough to persevere in love. Maybe I don't have enough, but I'm going to persevere. I am so grateful for the men who have persevered when I was studying the Bible. I remember calling Ricky Chalinor, and I apologize to Gidget about this already. I said, Ricky, I don't want to study the Bible. Leave me alone. And I just hung up on him. Actually, surely by that rude comment, he'll never call me. 10 o'clock at night. Hey, I, you must have been tripping over the phone or something. I didn't really hear you correctly. Why don't we just sit down? And this brother sits me down. He has the nerve to come to my house uninvited. And the scary part is that I had a code to my gate. I'm like, how'd you get in? But he persevered in loving me. You got to check your heart this morning. Have you been persevering in loving your brothers and sisters? It's easy when it's convenient. It's easy when they meet you at church. But what about when they don't come to church because they're struggling? Are you going out to reach out to them? How about persevering in loving the lost? That when someone says, no, 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 I don't really want to study. No, no, you, no, 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 you do want to study. You just don't know yet. You still don't know the riches of Jesus Christ. Let me sit down and show you. I believe that as a church, we need to step it up in persevering in love. Too many times we hear, well, this church is just not loving enough. You know what happened is you got sold a message from the scriptures, and then you got sold a church that wants to live up to the scriptures, but you forgot we're beings that want to please God but fall short. And God has given you the vision to see this is an area where we could step it up. Awesome. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to stay home because someone didn't love you? Or are you going to come and disciple them to love more? Not because you were hurt, but because you want to see God's kingdom grow in their love. Yes. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. As I'm running out of time, we're in our fourth church, Ephesus. And the fourth mark is the mark of true brotherhood. What is the mark of true brotherhood? We know from 1 John 1, it says, if you confess your sins to one another, then you'll be purified. There's something so refreshing about just confessing your sins. There's something so refreshing about confessing even your feelings. I think sometimes we just, have, I don't know if that's sin. I don't know if I have to get open with it. Jesus did not sin, but he got open with it. He said, guys, I am overwhelmed with sorrow. The mark of true brotherhood is that we share our sins. Severine told me the other day, she goes, bro, I am amazed of how much sin I know from you. What are you talking about, sis? That's not really good. He goes, I could just, I, I mean, it's crazy. I could see your sin. Amen, sis. Thank you. What does that mean, though? <laughs> she goes, well, I just, well, we've been to churches where I just don't know anything about the leaders, and yet we get to know each other so much, we do see each other's shortcomings. On, and not just our shortcomings, even our thoughts. We had a meeting with Joel the other day, and, and he starts off the meeting with, what's been your worst thoughts? I go, man, I've never, <laughs> that's how we're doing it? <laughs> like, we're just throwing out our worst thoughts right here? He goes, yeah, because if we're going to have true brotherhood, then we need to be truly honest. And that will, that's what I see the church in Ephesus do in verse 25. You guys with me here? Yes. Remember, it's for encouragement, guys. You still with me here? Yes. In verse 
25 of 20 says, Now I know that none of you among you whom I've gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today, I am innocent of the blood of any of you. I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you with night and day with tears. Verse 36, when Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. And they all wept as they embraced them and kissed them. What grieved them the most was a statement that they would never see his face again. And then they accompanied him to the ship. After they had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea. Whew! The Ephesus church believed in true brotherhood. What is the true brotherhood? Could you imagine? Paul gathers all of them, says, guys, you got to listen up here. I got to warn you. And it's never comfortable to warn someone, is it? Got to warn someone about something. But he said, I got to warn you, people are going to want to distort the truth. So be on your guard. He says night and day. That's true brotherhood. There's no work phone number for us in the church. We just say, you know what? We're, we're in each other's lives. We are loving the way Jesus told us to love, which is not just a fluffy love, but it's washing each other's dirty feet. And I'm talking about spiritually, amen? <laughs> Paul worked day and night to encourage the church. I was so encouraged by yesterday's paintballing session because I felt like that was true brotherhood right there. I mean, we go out and the game lasts about 10 to 15 minutes long. And a lot of these guys have never been paintballing before. And the ones I have were like, yeah, one year, like when I was like 12, <laughs> we're in for some trouble. And then six guys come and join us. And in this game, you couldn't really say no to people because there's only one game going on. So these six guys come, fresh gear. You know they didn't rent it. They got it from their house. Fresh guns. And they go, we want to be on the same team. And then Jesse steps up. He goes, hey, guys, you're not going to be on the same team, first of all. He goes, you guys look like you are way too good. We got to separate you three and three. A lot of these guys are rookies. They go, no, no, no. But, but we're rookies. Jesse's like, look, that's your own equipment. That's your own gun. You guys are not rookies. We're splitting you guys up. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. I mean, these guys look ruthless. But then you would go out. The first time I went out, there was this mud. I slipped and all my paintballs just flew out. And I'm sitting there in muddy dirt. I'm like, I don't know if I like this. But I get up. I go, okay, it's for Fernando. Let's do it. Go back on the field, and the next time, I was like a counter-strike type hero. I just go out, I found my hidden spot, I found a little... <laughs> little did I know, my brother Jesse is running after me. You hear the gunshots louder and louder, I'm like, this guy is shooting fast. He was right behind me, gums, and gives me the biggest bruise right here. <laughs> but it's okay, I told him I wanted to show my wife some battle scars when I get home, so he helped out with that. But just to think, that day, just even the brotherhood of, we're going to go out to fight. We played campus versus mingles. We played beards versus no beards. We were called the men anyways team. The men anyways on three. And because we had Jesse and Craig, we whooped them, amen? But... The feeling of, you know what, we may fall down in muddy, dirty spit, or we may have a victory. Nonetheless, we're focused on the next battle ahead of us. We're focused on the next victory. What bonds us? What helps us persevere in our love? We have another battle to fight. Yeah. It's called this coming week. We may lose some this past week. We may gain some this past week. But we are bonded because we still want to go out to the spiritual arena. We still want to persevere. And guess what? When it gets tough, that's what marks true brotherhood. 
I don't know how many of you guys saw the Fate of the Furious movie yet. Some of us. Well, in part of that movie, we know Vin Diesel plays an excellent, prideful, but victorious warrior in every movie. And in this movie, he gets shut down by a woman. And the woman simply asks Vin Diesel a question. He says, she said, well, what is the most important thing to you? He says, it's family. She says, no, it's not. It's not family. He says, yes, it is. It's brotherhood. He goes, no, it's not. Because you, every time you go out to race, you risk your life. And if you saw the first scene, he like won the race by reversing. His car was on fire. I don't want to give it away. It was awesome. But he almost killed himself and a lot of other people. And so the woman straight, straight up tells him, you know, you say that you're all about the family. You don't live it. And it got me thinking, we believe in the family. We believe in the brotherhood. We believe in all nations. But are we living like it? Look in Acts 19 to close out. The last church is the church in Rome. Acts 19, verse 21. Simply says, after all this had happened, it's one thing to do something for God. It's another after all these things had happened. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem. Passing through Macedonia and Achaia, he said, after I've been there, I must visit Rome also. What was Paul's vision? He says, I got to get a church to Rome. Why does he want to go to Rome? It was the most influential city to that time. Why? Because Caesar was there. Julius Caesar, the Strongest empire, the Roman Empire. We know from history that Paul died in Rome. He was beheaded. But he said, I want to go to Rome. I must go. Not because he worldly nature wanted to go. When God called him, what did he tell Paul? He said, you're going to be appointed to go speak to kings. Now, the first time he fell in a slimy pit. Remember that in Corinthians? He went to church. He had the opportunity to speak before a king. He put himself in a basket, said, hey, guys, lower me. I think they want to kill me. This is your time to preach to the kings. No, 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 no. It's not this time. And he says he uses that as a weakness. He remembers that. You know what's amazing, guys, is all of us come in here this morning with our own weaknesses. Yet in Hebrews 11:34, it says, out of weaknesses by faith, we will be strengthened. Out of our weaknesses, by faith, we will be strengthened. What marks the Rome church? It's disciple making. In our nature, we're not going to have the nature to make disciples yet. That's what marks a true church. Is are they making disciples? When I look at Paul receiving God's vision, I can't help but to think of himself taking on that very dream personal. Imagine if what you saw God's will was for you, you didn't just make it something you're surrendered to. All right, I'm surrendered to study the Bible. I'm surrendered to coming to church. I'm surrendered to going on a mission team. If you took in not just your will, but your vision and your dream, like Paul did. Paul says, I just want that so bad because I know that's what God wants. The way you build your life and where you see yourself in 10, 15, 30, 100 years from now determines how badly you have an ambition to do God's will. Will it get tough? Absolutely. But the only way to evangelize the world, the only way to stay faithful to God is to take God's vision personal. What have you been losing sight of yet need to be restored in? You know, we, when we first came around the church, we're so in love with the fellowship, with the vision, with the church. At some point, it starts to be a struggle to even do the very basic things we said we want to do. Stay faithful, marry a disciple, turn in special missions, evangelize, be in Bible studies. If those very things that you just were so fired up to do in the beginning are just not there anymore, I want you to mark 
just like the church in Rome, your true desires. We know from Romans 1 that God will hand us over to our true desires. If your desires just to sin, God will hand you over to that sin. But I pray as a family that we take on the very vision that Paul had to say, we must visit Rome. I don't know about you, but I'm like, we must visit Hong Kong. We must go there. We must preach the word there. Yes, there will be eight brothers in a small little place. The Chinese live differently. We're going to live differently here. But our vision stays the same. You know, I was very moved by a book that Gordon Ferguson wrote called My Three Lives. And in one of this, he shares a letter that was written to him by a young disciple in the ICOC there. And this is what the young campus student writes to Gordon, one of the leaders there. He says, Dear Gordon, I just finished reading In Search of an Ancient City that explains all church history, and he got me thinking a lot. I love the history of our church. It really fascinates me. I wanted to ask you what you thought of a more centralized structure of leadership in the church. I felt like we need a group of individuals that lead the movement in a direction that could be effective. I've been having conversations with leaders trying to understand various perspectives of what has happened or where our church is going, but the latter is what I care about the most. My question is, what do you feel about our church? What does it need to do to become a unified movement bent on evangelizing the world? Are there even talks to unify the movement and have a common vision? This was his response. And I share this because it's an awesome book, but I share this so you, we could appreciate what we have. He says, dear young brother, you raise an extremely important and very sensitive point to me. I've been doing a lot of thinking and praying and worrying about it all rolled up into one. What we had in the old days was an amazing unity of purpose to evangelize the world, driven in large part by the visions. One of the biggest issues we have, which some would cringe at hearing this, is that we no longer have a visionary prophet to inspire us in ways that really provide the impetus needed. Along with that vacuum came a focus on righting wrongs and in so doing, we became too afraid of allowing potential prophets to have a voice. Out of fear that we would slip back into the old way, the older generation had their day, and we were used by God in great ways, but we are no longer there. We are happy with 5% growth because we're comparing ourselves with other churches instead of the early church. I've criticized the mainline membership because they see baptisms as fire insurance. Much like an evangelical world sees getting saved, They want to live nice, comfortable little lives and still go to heaven when they die. Not many of us are members of the same mind anymore, which has resulted in a rejection of radical Christianity shown by actions, the type of religion that our founder clearly lived and died for. What should we do about it? You tell me. Are we doing it now? No. Can it be done? Yes. Will we do it? The answer is in your generation, young man. But be a prophet yourself. Enlist others to do the same. I preached often in the mainland that if we didn't get it done, God would raise up someone who did. And he did. And he will do it again. You just be a part of it. When I look at that vision of the prophets, I am so inspired that we have a visionary prophet, Kip McKean, leading the movement. I am so excited. Then when we look at the one true church, it's not a name. You can't say here it is or there it is. It's the disciples that live in unity. When God looks down from heaven, he doesn't see a name. Because when you die, it's not going to be, I went to this church. This was my discipler. There's no, I was here, I was there. It's, were you my son? Did you live My will or your will? Our sister Angie said it best. Living the disciple life is living the dream life. You know, in 1979, the movement was started with 29 disciples. In just 10 years, they grew to 36 churches in 60 nations. You know what I'm so excited for is that this coming week, 
we're gonna celebrate our 10th anniversary as a movement. From 2007 to 2017, we saw those 25 disciples that began in Portland, Oregon, to now multiply to 76 churches and 31 nations. We could see that it's not just growing faster, but it's gonna be about your personal growth. What is the one true church? We can't say here it is or there it is. But all we could do is like our brother Gordon said, you be a prophet. And guess what? When you open your eyes, you see others doing it. Enlist yourself in the one true church, which is the kingdom of God. And how do we know we're a part of it? Well, we talked about it today. We're disciple making. We have a true brotherhood. We have discipling. We got to have the message of Jesus. And when it gets tough, we're going to persevere in love till we make it to heaven. To God be the glory. <laughs>